Hi, I'm Dr. Heather Rice here and welcome to our Bulletproofing Your Low Back workshop. Thank you so much for coming. It is part of our year-long series. This month we're focusing on the low back. Next month we're going to be focusing on breathing issues, allergies, asthma, eczema, that sort of thing. And people are already coming in reporting that they're concerned about their allergies already this time of the year. So if you have a concern or you know somebody that's struggling with that, please invite them to come to our workshop on Wednesday, April 24th at 6.30 right here. All right, but tonight we're covering bulletproofing your low back. So how big of a problem is this? You know, I have people that come into my practice and uh, you know they would come in, get a few adjustments, and then they'd feel better, and then they leave, and then they come back when they were hurting a little bit, and and then you know they thought they would just wait until it got really bad, and then they'd come in and get adjusted, and by that time they've got a full-blown disc problem. It's shooting down their legs. They're in trouble. So what I when I talk about, about bulletproofing your low back, what I mean by that is. It's not that you'll never have back pain because the pain could be a signal that you have just overdone it. What I want to see is that you're going to recover from any injuries that you get and so that it's not going to turn into a whole degenerative process that's going to lead to terrible things like surgeries and that sort of thing. And so the research actually shows that people, depending on who you go to, if you have low back pain, could actually have a big impact on your outcomes. And it, the research shows that uh, and I'm just going to check my notes because I want to get the numbers right here. Yeah, the, the, the research shows that 20% of people that go to a medical doctor first, if they have low back pain, end up with surgery. Whereas 5% of the people that go to a chiropractor first end up with surgery. And in my own practice, the people that have been under my care in 35 years, I'd have, I've had two people that have had to go for surgery. So my numbers are even less than 1%. So it really does make a difference of who you're going to go to when you first encounter low back pain and it could affect your outcomes. Uh, so that's how important it is for us to discuss this and for you to understand what the problems are, uh, what is causing the low back pain so that you can finally heal it up and get the optimum function that you want rather than having it lead into trouble where you're heading for surgery. All right, so th what we're going to cover tonight is uh, understanding it, and then we're going to look at what are the options that are out there, both the conventional options as well as the ones that I've seen that do work over the years. All right, does that sound good to everybody? All right, let's go. If you struggle with low back pain, you know what it looks like. So you're going to experience the pain in the low back. There's going to be tight muscles, lost ranges of motion, stiffness, leg pain, shooting down the leg sometimes, or just achiness. Sometimes people will find that their foot and their ankles and their calves are, are, uh, have pain as well, leg pain. Swelling, burning, numbness, right? These are the ways that it shows up when I see people when they come into my clinic. And uh, for some people, it's everything from just a little nagging kind of thing to something that's debilitating. Now, there are usually two types of people that are interested in this program. One is a type that maybe occasionally has some low back pain or not very much, but they want to prevent it from turning into something that's debilitating. And then there are those that are struggling and have not found the solutions that they want and they're looking for what can they do right now to improve it and then to also prevent it from reoccurring. So th this is what it looks like and you know it can be everything from just annoying and aggravating to really affecting your life where you're missing work, where you're irritable and angry with the rest of your family, where you can't provide for your family and also how it affects your levels of exercise, your levels of sleep. It affects all different areas of our life. And so it's definitely something that we want to address. And who is it affecting? Again, it's affecting actually women a little bit more than men. And yet when they talk about how often it prevents somebody from going to work, it's a lot less in women. So they're powerhouses, yeah, <laughs> they just tough up, right? Yeah. Um, but the life effect is important to recognize that it, it's affecting our life. And when I talk to people about why do they want to come to see me if they have low back pain, it's usually because it's affecting their life, not just because it's a pain, but because it's starting to affect their life. So we want to learn how to not just correct, but also prevent it from turning into something worse. 
Um, so we're going to go into some of the anatomy that's involved because the more that you can understand this, then the better decisions you'll make. So let's pop right into that. What I find in my clinic very commonly is folks that come in with low back pain, it can be coming from the pelvis and the sacrum. So this is looking at a model of the pelvis from the front. So we can see the bottom of the lumbar spine here. Here's the sacrum. And then we can see the pelvis on either side. This joint right here, which is the sacroiliac joint on either side, that joint right there is one that can become unstable. When it becomes unstable, it's the whole foundation of the body. So remember, this is the spine, but the rest of the spine is all stacked up on top. So the whole weight of the body is sitting on the sacrum and is, and is being um, supported by these two joints. They are some of the most complex joints in the body, the sacroiliac joints. And so uh, oftentimes, it's not something that would show up on an x-ray that there's dysfunction there, and so it often gets missed. But when it is affected, it means that it's a functional problem. It means that the joint doesn't move properly. So if it's not moving properly, it starts to affect everything else around it. Classically, people will not just have pain in the low back, but they'll have a knee problem, and then a foot problem, then an elbow problem, then a shoulder problem, then a jaw problem. Because when this joint goes off, it starts to affect the, the, the um, it's a cascading effect with all the other joints, the whole kinetic chain. So getting this sacroiliac joint stabilized is key if that is what the problem is. And if it is not stabilized, the foundation of the spine can start to be so unstable that the muscles on either side of the lumbars will start to spasm. And when they start to spasm because the foundation is unlevel, then that spasming can start to put pressure on the discs and lead to disc problems. So we're going to cover that in a moment, but I wanted to make sure you understood that uh, at least half of the people that come in when they have low back problems, it's stemming from the sacro iliac on either side. Okay, the lumbar spine sits right on top of that. So um, we're looking at the spine from the side right here. The lumbars are the low back vertebrae right here. And the vertebrae are, are building blocks here. So these are solid blocks here. And then in between the bones are the discs, right in between. And the discs are the spacers, but they also allow for movement because one solid bone, if all those bones were just fused together in one solid bone, it might be very protective, but you'd have no movement. And so the discs are the spacers in between that allow for movement and also um, to keep the, the hole the right size for the nerve to come through so that it has room to breathe to carry the messages from the brain out to the body. So we have five, usually five lumbar vertebrae, and then the sacrum is sitting right at the bottom here. So that's how the lumbar spine looks. You'll notice that there's a curve in the spine, and that's looking at it from the side where the front is here and the back is here. So this lumbar curve, that curve is what provides spring in the spine. And the spring in the spine is what protects the vertebrae and the discs from deteriorating. All right, so that's the anatomy. Now that you understand that, let's look at the actual disc herniation if that were to happen. So here is the bone on either side. Here's the disc. If the bone misaligns, it starts to irritate the disc, and the disc can actually it can compress on the disc, and it can start to um, put pressure. It can get swollen and bulge out and even herniate so that it starts to affect the nerve. This is looking at it from the top down on the left here. And we can see here's the center of the disc material. Here are the fibers all around the disc. And then this is what happens if, if those fibers weaken, the disc material can start to bulge and ooze out, and that's where it can put pressure on the nerve. It also can put pressure right on the spinal cord itself if it bulges out in the center. And of course, if the, there is pressure on the spinal cord or the nerves, then the messages that are trying to pass from the brain to the body and back again are going to be altered and distorted and affected, and that can affect function in the body. So we're going to look at this in a moment, but when we have this dysfunctional joint that's affecting the disc and the nerves, it, it leads to degenerative change. So let's take a closer look at the disc and what's happening here with the disc. So we can see the yellow part is the jelly part of the donut, if you think of it as a jelly donut. The yellow part is the jelly, and then the fibers all around it are what keep that jelly in place. And if you notice, there are layers of fibers here, 
annulus fibrosis is the name of this um, tissue. And these fibers, if you look even more closely, you'll see that they're at a diagonal. And so these uh, sheets or layers, one uh, layer is at one diagonal. The next layer on top of it is perpendicular to that. It's at an opposite diagonal. The next one on top of that is opposite. And so you have these overlaying fibers that are crisscrossed. If there's pressure on the disc that is squishing and, and pushing the, tish, the, disc, the jelly in the disc out against those fibers, and those fibers start to lose integrity so that they are getting worn out, what can also happen is the fibers can split apart. And if they split apart, then the disc material can ooze through. And that can be a disc herniation that happens in a moment that can happen. And so there's some interesting research not too long ago that came out of the Bethesda Naval Hospital where they found that if you took the pressure off the disc and you twisted the vertebra back and forth, the twisting of it could bring the fibers back into alignment and the disc material could get sucked back in and the fibers could then start doing their job again of holding the disc in. So for some people, it could be that their disc herniation is not from a breaking of the fibers completely, but of a separating of the fibers. And then it can happen rather quickly where the disc can get sucked back in and the fibers can um, realign. They still have to heal up, but that recovery can be quite quick. Other folks that have chronic disc problems over time where those in fibers just lose their integrity and they're just breaking apart, that kind of disc herniation is harder to deal with and sometimes there's too much damage and we can't help with that. So I wanted you to understand that there are different types of disc problems that can occur and some have, can have great outcomes and are easy to correct. All right, so when you do have anything pressing on the disc uh, or the disc pressing on the nerves, uh, it can cause pain shooting down the leg, something called sciatica. So you can see these big nerves are coming out from the bottom of the spine and they're running right down the leg. And that nerve is called the sciatic nerve. And so if you have discs bulging here, they can affect the fibers that come out and join together and come right down the leg. So you can feel that pain going all the way down into the leg, even as far as the foot. And it can be pain, it can be numbness, it can be tingling, it can be going into the buttocks or all the way down the legs and right e even into the feet. All right, so that's what sciatica is if that's happening. Uh, let's just show you now an x-ray of what, that, what it looks like if you have uh, a misalignment in the spine and how that can affect things. So in an x-ray, this is the one on the left here, we don't see the soft tissue in an x-ray, we only see the bones. And so we see here in this one, this is a healthy normal on the left, and you see this beautiful forward curve. So the, um, the left-hand side of the picture is the back of the person, the right-hand side of the picture is the front of the person, so we're looking at them from the side, and there should be a beautiful forward curve. So what it looks like in real life is that the, the front of the spine is here, the back of the spine is here, so the curve should be going forward in the spine, right? So when we lose that curve, that's when we can start to put pressure on the discs. And sometimes you can have, it looks like, you can't tell that there's a loss of the curve, but there's a subluxation where the vertebrae are misaligned. So I'm gonna show you that here. In an x-ray where there's subluxations or misalignments of the vertebrae, here's the sacrum at the bottom, and this is the curve that we should see, but here are where all the bones are. So you can see the sacrum is at the bottom, L5 is posterior, it's, it's misaligned backwards. The next one, L4, it's misaligned backwards. And so that can start to affect the disc in between the bones, and it can start to cause that disc to herniate. So again, on an x-ray, we don't see the disc. We don't see any of the soft tissue. We only see the bones. So if we look at an MRI, this one on the right, we can see here's the sacrum at the bottom, and here's the disc. Here's the bone, the L5. Here's the disc. Here's the L4. Here's the disc. Up here, you can see this white part in the middle. That's the spinal cord. All right, so the spinal cord is running right down through the center. You can see how flat it is at the top here. There's the discs that have good, uh, are the, there's good integrity here holding those discs in place. But when we get down to the part where the vertebrae were misaligned, 
we can see the pressure that's coming on the disc. See how that disc is pushing out into the, sp the spinal canal? And it's really pushing out a lot at the bottom here, at uh, the L4, L5, and then at L5 sacrum, we can see it also. So this is often referred to as a slipped disc or a disc herniation. Now, you should know that the thing that frustrates me the most about this is that most of the time, this is completely preventable. And it's definitely something that's correctable. So I get frustrated when people are suffering over long periods of time when actually it's something that could have been addressed. Um, and it's also quite interesting when we talk about using x-rays as a tool to identify what's going on. Certainly we can get great pictures like this, but it is interesting that when they do blind research studies where they just show MRIs to radiologists with no information about any symptoms, what the radiologists have found is that they can find evidence of disc herniations in 50% of the people that have disc symptoms, and 50% of the people with disc symptoms have no herniations. They also found that there were 50% of the people that had no symptoms at all that had disc herniations on an x-ray. So we have to take the information from the x-ray and the MRIs, we have to take that information along with our other tests so we can make sense of it. Clearly, if someone has disc herniations and no symptoms, isn't that something that we still need to address? Yeah, absolutely, because over time, it's not going to be, the chances are they're going to have trouble in the future. Okay, so when you look at the x-ray and the MRI, the, the person is facing to the right, and so you're looking at them from the side, as you can see. And in the healthy normal, you can see the beautiful forward curve in the lumbar spine. And then you see the x-ray in the middle is showing how there's subluxation, there's misalignment of those vertebrae. And then the MRI shows how it's affecting the soft tissue and including the disc. So once you can see that, now I want to show you on a, a structural model, where does this come from? How does it end up there? And then where does it go from there? Because after 35 years in practice, I know where this goes, and I want you to understand that too, and how the degenerative process can go on, and how it's so important to really prevent that from happening. So here's what I want to show you. If we look at a healthy structural unit, vertebral unit, we can see the disc is nice and robust and healthy and fat, and the bones are nice and smooth. There's plenty of room for this robust nerve to come through and carry the messages from the brain to the body and back again. And so this disc is doing its job to act as a spacer so that that hole stays the right size for the nerve to have room to breathe. All right, that's the healthy normal. Everything in alignment, healthy discs, healthy bones, healthy nerves. If we have a misalignment of the vertebra, so you might be able to see that this is a little bit tipped, now we're going to start to put stress on the disc, and that can make the disc inflamed. And you can see that this disc is actually being uh, compressed a bit. So what we don't see on this model of the muscles, when the vertebra goes out of alignment and it starts to irritate things, the muscles will strap down this joint, and in strapping down the joint, it can compress the vertebrae, putting them closer together, which then can put pressure on the disc. The disc is now going to start to put, pre could put pressure on the nerves. All right, what you also notice is this is someone who's had subluxations for a period of time where we're starting to actually see early degenerative change. The edges of the bones are getting a bit roughened, and that's the very beginning of it, okay? If it isn't stabilized and corrected at this point, then we're going to see over time that that roughening turns into bone spurs, this candle dripping effect that we see here. Here you can see the disc now is oozing out, and you can see how it's putting pressure on the nerve. And look at how these nerves, they're not quite so robust anymore. So this is a long period of time that this is happening now over a few years. And that, that candle dripping piece happens. The scientists wanted to know when they saw that this happened to the bones, how fast does the bone start to change once you just start with a misalignment, just misalignment, uh, misaligning the vertebrae, how fast does it take before the osteophytic bone spurs start to show up? And the scientists found out it only took two weeks at a microscopic level for the bone cells to start changing so that they started to move towards osteophytosis or this, this um, bone spurring. If it's still not stabilized, caught, and corrected at this point, then we're going to see trouble. 
So here, these bones, they're fused now. These bone spurs, they're fused together. We can't move this bone anymore. The disc has now gotten all dried out. Look at these nerves. And if the nerves are looking like that, what do you think the parts of the body look like that these nerves are in charge of controlling? So they're gonna be all deteriorated and, and withered as well. So I wanted you to see where this goes. Now, what does that look like as a timeline? What's causing this? Let me take you through the timeline of what happens in our lives in the way that our stressful environment has been engineered. How does it affect us? So check this out. Here we have all the symptoms and now this is how it goes. It can be a, a timeline that happens here. So we have all of these uh, symptoms that can occur, but when does it start? Like when would the disc herniation start? How long ago could it have started? So check it out. If we think about toddlers, when you're first learning how to walk, what happens? Mm -hmm. Boom, 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 right? So it turns out that in the beginning, when toddlers are first learning to walk, they can oftentimes get themselves up, but they can't get themselves down. So they're always crashing down onto their bottoms in the beginning. And so that can start to create possibilities of subluxations or misalignments, right? Then those toddlers, they grow up and now they're school age. Now you're in school. What happens at school? You're sitting, right? You're sitting a lot. And then you go into your teen years and maybe there's sports injuries, that sort of thing. Uh, but then you're again sitting and now you start to get screens and devices. And we can see how posturally that starts to lead into poor posture that can put more and more pressure on the spine, especially on the lower back. And then you get into driving car accidents that maybe they jar the neck, but they can jar the low back as well. Again, the sports injuries. Then you start to get into the 20s and you'll hear people that talk about, oh, I worked out too hard or I went skiing and you know my sports. That's what triggered a, a little bit of low back discomfort, right? Then you're getting into the 30s and people are starting to get a little bit more sedentary and they talk about how they tweaked their back, maybe doing yard work, that sort of thing. And then you start to see people kind of backing off from the rigorous exercise they did when they were younger. They're not gonna do that kind of exercise anymore. They're getting a bit more sedentary. They're getting their jobs in their 20s and 30s that are oftentimes, again, sedentary, eight to 10 hours sitting in a day. And then in the 30s and 40s, now we're starting to hear, it's not just a tweak, but my back is, um, you know, is starting to go out, right? And then they get in their 50s and their back is going out more than they are, right? <laughs> Getting more and more sedentary, they're backing off from fun things, right? And, and they're not able to enjoy the things they did in the past, hiking and, and sports, athletics, nature, and they're just, they're starting to live around their problem. And we can just see how this unfolds over time until in their 60s, now they're talking about it, oh, it's just arthritis now. And we, you know, well, I can't, uh, I can't, definitely can't run anymore, but I can walk to the car, right? <laughs> right? So you're seeing how people, their lives become more and more restricted as they're trying to live around it, right? And so we have to ask the question, in their 60s and they're wondering, is there a solution to this? When did this start, right? and we can see our culture in our lifestyles, we have set it up, we have engineered it, that it's easy for low back problems to start to occur because of the lifestyles that we lead. So sometimes there's a big injury that seems to be the cause of something, but more often than not, what we're finding is that it's the traumas along with life, that is the in life meaning the bad habits, the poor posture, all of those things that culminate into, you know, going into a symptomatic response. And maybe you were, has this happened to you? I was just bending over to brush my teeth. I was just bending over to pick up my keys, right? And my back went out, right? And so it wasn't just that action. It's everything that was leading up to that. All right, so what are the ways that we can address this? The options that we have, if we look at the conventional options, what we would call the allopathic options. So uh, certainly drugs is one of the big concerns and we definitely can see in our culture how big of a problem drugs have become uh, with the whole opioid crisis. We're gonna look at that in a moment. So if we look at how bad it's gotten with using the allopathic options as our conventional way of dealing with this, 
How bad is it? I'm going to just look at my uh, notes here because uh, there's some stats that are amazing to hear. So first off, 80% of Americans will experience back pain, 80% in their lifetimes. And as I said, uh, a third of people at any given time are going to be experiencing back pain. So think of the people you know. One in three of the people you know right this minute are experiencing some kind of low back pain. Um, and the other thing is the cost of it. So it, th this, these numbers are astounding. We're spending $50 billion in direct cost just for treating low back pain. $50 billion. And $100 billion in indirect cost. And what that means is maybe somebody's still showing up for work, but they're on medication so they're not thinking as clearly or the pain is so uncomfortable that they're not as productive. So those productivity costs also are part of it. Or if you are out of work, there's a direct cost to the treatment of the pain, but there's the indirect cost to your family because you're not earning money that you need to be earning. So the indirect costs are reaching $100 billion and it's only trending upward in the cost to our country. So I wanted to make sure that you saw those things. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's this whole idea of how we're living around the problem that is where, where I see the, that it affects people's lives the most. So those are the stats. Let's look at now uh, some of the things that the research tells us. So this is a, a chart that's showing us the drug production, how many drugs are being produced. And this is from 93 to 2016. And you can see how the light blue is oxycodone, also known as oxycontin or Percocet. The green is the hydrocodone, that's Vicodin. So these are names that you've heard of. Um, when we look at the, the, the lighter green, that's morphine. And then the darker blue, that's some other types of hydromorphone. So we can see it all there. And then the black at the bottom is the fentanyl. So you know that some of these are showing up as street drugs as well. And what's happening is you can see how the inflection point is happening in the early 2000s, and early to mid 2000s, it starts to grow. And our production of these drugs is going up and up and up. Now in, the, in 2016, it started, and up to the present, it started to go down. But all that's happening is the, incident, the use of heroin is going up. So people are getting cut off because of the policies of we're going to stop allowing you to get the opioids that we've created the addiction for. And now folks are going to the street where heroin is 10% is the cost of the prescription medications and now we're getting some serious problems. So this is, this is definitely, there's, this is the legal narcotic production, but of course there's the prevalence of the heroin that's, that's part of this picture as well. So if we look at opioid prescriptions, watch how this is, uh, is, is happening over time. If we look at all of the different states in our country and the use, the, the use of prescriptions per 100 people, check this out. So the light green is there's 50 to 60 prescriptions per 100 people. That's 50 to 60 percent of the population, right? Uh, yellow is 65 to 82. Orange, 85 to 100. When we would hit 100, that means there is a prescription in that state for everybody, every man, woman, and child. There's a prescription that's there. Do you see what's happening? And look at these states where it's, where it's dark orange and, and red. Look at this, the Mississippi Valley, right? That's a problem. <laughs> it's happening there where it's 120 to 140% of the population, right? That's more than one prescription for every man, woman, and child, right? That's a problem that's happening. You can see it. This, um, this opioid alley that's happening here in the Mississippi Valley. All right, and so we know that it's causing death as well. And we know that the stats are, and this is from 2010, 40 people a day are dying from narcotic prescription overdose. Now this, this is hitting close to home. There are lots of people that know folks that have gotten into this trap. Maybe they had an athletic injury or a work injury and they were put on narcotics as opioids as the painkillers and they created an addiction. And there are stories, tragic stories, of these productive people that get hooked and addicted to the opioids and then it turns into a heroin addiction and they lose everything. They lose their families, their jobs, their homes. They lose everything because they've gotten addicted to these substance that was treating a, a situation where there was pain. 
there are, uh, it, it's happened even in my family. My cousin, she was, uh, had back pain. She had morphine patches that she would use. The idea with the morphine patches is when you put it on, it gets used up. Then you take that one off and then you put the next one on. And she made the mistake of not taking one off and putting another one on. And her 11 year old daughter found her dead in the bed. Yeah. So it affects a lot of people and people hear stories about this. It's infected our family as well. So you have that happening and yet people think of, you know, oh, well, heroin, that's a recreational drug that people use. And yes, even in my family, I've had a niece who her first, her first exploration with heroin as a recreational drug killed her, right? So we know that that's already a problem. But a lot of the heroin deaths we're finding now are from people that got addicted from the prescription medications, not just from recreational use. So it's a serious problem. In 2010, there were enough prescription painkillers being prescribed. This is prescribed medications. This is not street drugs. Prescribed to medicate every American adult around the clock for a month. That's how much it's being prescribed. So it's a problem and it's creating deaths from this as well. If we look at the overdose deaths involving opioids, cocaine, and heroin, and you do a comparison over time, we see from 1999 up to 2010, we can see that this red line, this is the opioid use, prescription opioid use, and it's just climbing, climbing, climbing. If we look at cocaine, which is a recreational drug, right? It climbed and then it actually went down. And if you look at heroin, again, we think of it as a recreational drug and we see it staying about the same. And then right in 2006, there's an inflection point where it now goes up 45%. And that's happening right around the time when we're starting to get awareness and people are, are not be getting their um, opioids or it's too expensive and they're switching over to heroin. And these are the deaths that are coming from that. And so it's all over the news, right? We know this is a problem. And opioids, these, these prescriptions have exceeded every other category of prescription. Like people know of folks that are on statin drugs. People know of people that are on um, anti-anxiety medications. But nobody's talking about this. This is exceeding those. And we know how prevalent those ones are, statins and anti-anxiety and the opioids are exceeding that, but it's not being talked about and it's causing, it's all over the news. Can we all agree that we've got a problem here and we need a better way? We need a better way, no doubt. So if we look back at these options, like heat, is heat a good idea? Well, heat certainly can be applied and it may have the impact of relaxing muscles, but if something is already inflamed, and you add heat, sometimes it can increase the inflammation. So you're using it to try and be palliative, to try and make it feel better, but it actually may be making it worse. So with all these options, the first question we have to ask is, what is the objective? So when someone comes to me and they say, doc, should I take this drug? My answer is, I don't know. What's your objective? So look clearly at what your objectives are. The questions that you ask will lead you to the decisions that you're going to make. So I want you to be thinking of different questions to be asking. Most of the time in our culture, when you have low back pain, the only question is, how do I get the pain to stop? Well, drugs would do that. And we can see the trouble that it brings because our only objective is to get the pain to stop. So we want to look at closely at what is our objective. Is our objective to get healthier, to restore function, to have a, a good outcome over a long period of time? then you're gonna look for something different than relying on a drug for that. So what about bed rest? Bed rest, it's important maybe for the first 48 hours, but after that, it actually shows worse outcomes. So we wanna get people up and moving as soon as we can, but sometimes it's important to not just keep pushing through it. And that's what actually can happen is people will use the medication so they can keep pushing through it and not have the bed rest so they can keep going to work when actually they needed to have the bed rest for a couple of days and then they need to start getting moving. So heat and bed rest is a very common recommendation. The drugs, we can see where that one goes. Physical therapy, because the drugs are just masking the problem. And you'll find over and over again that when folks, they get on these opioids, if they go off of them, the pain comes back. So that's why they're staying on them. And then you turn it into an addiction 
and then now they're hooked on them. They can't get off of them. Physical therapy certainly can be useful. Physical therapy tends to be treating the um, tissues around it, but it still may not be getting to the cause. So physical therapy is going to be most useful if it's rehabilitative or restorative in nature rather than just trying to treat the pain. Um, but still, we want to make sure that we're getting to the cause of it. Steroid injections. Again, this is a, an aggressive way to try to drop inflammation, but the use of the steroid injections, it actually will, will, actually will cause the tissue to break down in the joint. So it is a short-term solution that actually is so powerful that it can lead to a loss of integrity of the tissue that you're trying to heal up. So that tissue breaks down from the injections of the steroids. So if you can avoid the steroid injections, that's a good strategy because if you're wanting to heal that tissue up and not just drop the inflammation at all costs and not just try to deal with the pain at all costs, if you want to get long-term healing, you're going to want to avoid the steroid injections because the steroid will break down the tissue that you're trying to heal up. Pain management, again, this is when you're getting desperate and you can't find anything else. And there's many different techniques that are being used. Again, could be useful, but are you getting to the underlying cause and correcting the cause? We still want to ask that question. So what is the objective of the pain management? Is it simply allowing you to tolerate it or do you want to actually get to the cause where you can correct it? Surgery, okay, surgery. Again, we have to ask the right questions. And asking the question, is it safe and effective? What does the research show? Is an important question to ask. What's the safety of any of these options? What's the effectiveness of any of these options? What's the short-term outcomes and the long-term outcomes? So let's take a look at surgery as an option. And again, people, they don't want surgery. They want to avoid it. <coughs> the uh, research tells us that uh, in the past, surgeries were one of the things that people went to very quickly. Spinal fusion surgery uh, when treating a degenerative change, degenerative joint disease and low back pain, it increased 220 percent from 1990 to 2001. And the other interesting research was that <coughs> the best outcomes for low back pain were in communities where the surgery rates were the lowest in that area. In, in areas where the surgery rates were the highest, we had the worst outcomes for low back pain. They have some new fusion um, surgery techniques um, that actually can increase the risk of nerve injury, blood loss, overall complications, operative times, uh, again, repeat surgeries, so they don't result in improved disability or reoperation rates. So even though they've changed the way they're doing things, it's not actually creating better outcomes. So if you look at what happens, I mean, basically, think about it. We've, we've got knee replacements, we've got hip replacements. We're, surgically, the, the stats show that we're doing pretty well with those as far as um, fail. they're not failing now, right? but the back surgeries are still a problem. And you look at what's happening, they're pretty much ripping open your spine here, and now they're working right next to the most delicate tissue in the body, the nervous system, right? The spinal cord, the spinal nerve roots are right there. And when they start to put these, um, these uh, contract, these, uh, it's hardware they're putting in there, right? When they put that in there, that's what can then start to backfire and cause problems later. So. Uh, surgery, everybody would agree, it's not the best option. If you look at the safety rates and the efficacy rates, the research is showing that it's not effective, that it's not safe. Um, and so let's now look at a better way that may be o being overlooked by some people because they didn't know about it. If you look at chiropractic, here's just one study that showed uh, what they did is they had a Blue Cross Blue Shield company, they allowed chiropractors to be primary care physicians and, and be the referrers. So people could, instead of going to their MD to get referred in the, their insurance, they could go to a chiropractor to be referred. And in over a seven year period, they had 70,000 uh, members that they could do a comparison over. And look what happened in the folks that used chiropractors, they had a decrease of 60% hospital admissions, decrease of 59% hospital days, decrease of 62% outpatient surgeries and procedures, and a decrease of 85% pharmaceutical costs. Now you know if the cost is going down, it means the pharmaceutical use is going down, right? 
and check out, wouldn't you love to have those outcomes for yourself? But also, wouldn't the insurance company love to have that outcome? Because both folks were paying the same premiums and they were saving a lot of money with the folks that were using chiropractors. So this is when they were comparing it to conventional medical intervention. Fabulous study. So there's lots of other studies out there. I'm not going to go into detail, but this one I thought was very demonstrative. So again, these are the things that show up. And remember, these are all symptoms that are signals that your body is giving you. And instead of wanting to just mask those symptoms, what if we started to understand the signals, the language that our body was communicating with us? Sometimes the body's going to whisper and sometimes it starts to scream at us to get our attention. But if we can understand what it's trying to tell us, then we can do the right thing so that we can get to the healing that we really want. So again, the symptoms are oftentimes just the tip of the iceberg. They are the sign that there's a bigger problem underneath. And that's what we want to look at. We want to uncover what's the bigger problem that's causing the symptoms and address that. And that's where we're going to get the solutions to optimal health that we all want. So I want to, again, let's just look at this idea of symptoms and where do they fall in the illness wellness um, continuum. Because many people are still using how they feel as an indication of how healthy they are. Oh, I don't have any back pain today. I'm good today. Oh, but last week I was hurting. And then, uh, oh, today I'm feeling good, so I'm okay, right? We, we go fickle back and forth of how we feel. But there's important information that I'm going to show you about relying on how you feel as it's not the best way to measure how healthy you are. So let's take a look at this. Where do the symptoms fall? This is a, from a gold standard study that was done in the 70s, in the 80s, and again in 2004. And what they did is they looked at a large population of people and they wanted to measure what was happening with their health over time. And what they recognized is that everybody was going to be on this spectrum somewhere. So you have robust levels of health here, you have death here. So that's the continuum. In the middle is something that they called the neutral point. And so they identified there were three zones here. There was the sick zone, the not sick zone, and the healthy zone. And they found that this was the spot where there was no, um, you couldn't discern illness or wellness here. So there was nothing I, that you could identify or label as a disease or a problem but it was definitely different from having robust levels of health. And when they watched over time, they recognized that everybody was going to be somewhere on this scan, this, this, this uh, continuum, and nobody was standing still. Everybody was moving in one direction or the other. And what they found is that before symptoms showed up, signs would start to show up first. So for example, if we're talking about heart disease, before you feel heart disease, there's ways you can measure the presence of it, like taking your blood pressure, looking at your heart rate, like measuring those kinds of things. Those are signs. So the difference between a sign and a symptom, a sign is something that you can measure, but you may not feel. A symptom is when you're feeling it. So what they found is that the signs would show up before the symptoms would show up. And if the symptoms didn't get addressed and function continued to decrease, it would lead to disability where disability is where you can't fix it anymore. You just have to try to learn to live with it. And that's on your way towards early death, all right? On the other side of it, moving towards robust health, you had to have awareness and then educate yourself and then grow right into it and work at it. That's what they discovered. So symptoms definitely will tell us which direction we're headed, but they're not gonna tell us, they, 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 we can't use it as the indication of whether we're healthy or not. Because you could have no symptoms right here and still have loss of function. You see, if you weren't measuring the signs, you wouldn't know that you, weren't, that you were not healthy. But if you can measure the signs, you'll know that. Now, everybody in this room, everybody watching this, is going to fall somewhere on this continuum. And everybody's going to be moving in one direction or the other, some at different speeds as well. So you could be at robust levels of health and then you injure yourself you could very quickly drop down into symptoms, but then you could also recover and improve very quickly back to robust health. Other people may be losing function over a long period of time, and they're already moving this direction. When they start to do something to help themselves, we just need to slow down the momentum to start with and then turn the corner and start moving the other direction. 
right? So it's such an important idea that we need to understand here. And here's the reason why. What are the symptoms of low back pain? It's pain. And people think, my problem started when the pain started. What would the signs be? What would the signs be that we could measure to tell us they're on their way to that? We have ways of measuring that. So people will get their blood pressure checked, they'll get their, their cholesterol checked. They're measuring different things to try and get early detection on uh, chronic illnesses. But people are not necessarily measuring what they need to measure to know the signs that they're moving towards loss of function that could lead to low back pain where they have symptoms. So again, it's, all, it's a, a question of thinking of how you feel versus how you function. So here's something very important that you may not know that's so important. If you look at a nerve and that what, what is inside of a nerve, it's made of many, many fibers. All right, so I want you to understand how the spinal cord and the nerves, what they're like. So this is an old telephone cable and it's a whole bunch of wires all joined together, right? All bundled up together. The spinal cord is also a collection of nerve fibers. And so those nerve fibers are running from the brain down the spinal cord and then they'll come out in the spinal nerve roots, which are also another bundle of nerve fibers. And so each of these fibers is doing something different. Just like you could hear different conversations going back and forth, each nerve has a different function. So some of these nerves are carrying messages up to the brain to tell the brain what's happening. And some of those sensory nerves are also sensing pain. So if a pain fiber gets signaled, then that's going to send that signal up to the brain and you'll perceive it in the brain. Some of these fibers might be feeling um, temperature or pressure, carrying that information to the brain. Some are sensing movement and carrying that information to the brain. So the brain is tracking all of that information and based on that information, it's going to send a response out that will control a muscle or control an organ. So some of the muscles, some of the nerves are going to the muscles, some of the nerves are going to the organs, blood vessels, and glands. But the part that's going out is not the part you feel. The only part you feel is the part that's going up to the brain. So sensory goes up to the brain, motor and autonomic or automatic functions are going out from the brain, but that's the part you can't feel. The interesting thing that's so important is that only 10% of the nerves' jobs, those fibers, is to feel pain, only 10%. The other 90% is running function, but that's the part you can't feel. So we have to be able to measure what's happening with the other parts of the nervous system as a sign that you may be moving towards low back pain and dysfunction. So, uh, and it's interesting that uh, when there, there was a study done even as far back as 1921, Henry Windsor was a medical doctor and he understood that the nerves go to all the different parts of the body and certain organs. So this nerve coming out here goes to a certain organ. And what he found was a 90% correlation with where there was misalignment in the vertebrae and degenerative change in the vertebrae and the organ that was affected. He did autopsies. So he found people that didn't have a complaint about their liver uh, having any problem, but when they died, he looked at what was happening in the spine, and then he looked, followed that nerve out and looked at that organ, and he found in 90% of the cases, there was some pathology, some disease in those organs where that nerve was in charge of controlling it. 90%. And that was even without symptoms for that person during their life. So, we know that if we're going to be measuring the signs of what's setting you up, are you on your way to low back pain, then we better be measuring the nervous system. So when we look at this nerve supply, we can see the spine is like a fuse box where the, all the nerves are traveling through it from the brain down through the spinal cord and then out through the nerves to go to all the organ systems. So we have the central nervous system, which is the brain and the spine. We have the peripheral nervous system, which are the nerves that carry the messages back and forth and then we have the organ systems. And down in this bottom um, right corner, we can see this is one of the scans that we use to measure the nerve supply to the muscles, for example. And we can see in this person a whole lot of activity where these muscles are in a spasm state. This is not what they're feeling, 
This is the function of running the muscles. So this is that motor nervous system. We have another scan that will measure nerve supply to the blood vessels, organs, and glands. So we can literally see in advance where you're going to have trouble. This is one of the signs that we can use of whether or not you have a healthy spine. And if you don't have a healthy spine, then there's a greater risk that you're going to end up with low back pain that could end up being disabling if you don't actually get healthier spinal function. So what is it that causes the trouble in the spine? It's stress that causes that trouble in the spine, and it's coming at us from all directions. When we are in a stress response, and actually, let me just back up in a second and explain one more thing here. When we have a misalignment of the vertebrae, if it's interfering with that function going to the organs or the muscles, the information coming back up to the spine is going to be carrying a message that says there's trouble going on down here. It may not be a pain signal, but it's a signal that carries feedback back to the brain about what's happening in the body. And if there's trouble going on, that feedback is actually setting the brain into a stress response. And so that stress response can create global stress through the whole system. Now what does a stress response look like in the body? This is what it looks like. See if you recognize this. Blood pressure goes up, heart rate goes up, muscle tone tenses, digestion is upset, reproductive drive goes down, we have decreased serotonin levels that affect sleep, increased sensory systems on alert with fear and anxiety, our immune response goes down in tanks, our insulin sensitivity is downregulated, blood sugar goes up, we have a decrease and uh, we have a flipping of the lipids so that they're unhealthy, decrease in the HDLs increase in the LDLs, increase in cholesterol, and clotting factors increase. What does this look like? It looks like a heart attack ready to happen, right? Yeah, this is a stress response. Now, if a tiger was chasing you, this is what would save your life. And in the short term, it is what can still save our life, but in the long term, it's shortening our lives. It's shortening our lives. And so when we have stress physiology happening in our body, it's adaptive physiology. It was only meant to be there short term, but if we have ongoing stress, then it sets it up so it's long term. Chronic stress now leads to chronic illness. So when you have the misalignments of the spine that are putting pressure on the nerves and sending that stress signaling, it actually can have a global response that can set you up for higher incidence of chronic illness as well. So we certainly, if we're using pain or how we feel as our way of managing our health, we need a better way. We need a better premise. So let's look at what a better premise would be. And it starts with the idea that healthy is normal. That it's normal to just be healthy. Even though if we look at our culture, our culture is looking at it as though unhealthy is normal. We look around as, oh, one in three people have low back pain. We're thinking it's normal to have low back pain. Oh, well, it's normal to have low back pain. Everybody's got it. No, healthy is normal. Your body is smart. Your body is smart. So all the reactions that you have, when you get those signals, even pain, it's a smart signal from the body trying to get your attention, trying to get you to stop doing what you're doing and make a change. If we just mask the signals our body's giving us, we're basically saying, body, you are not smart. You're stupid. I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing, but I'm going to mask this because you're doing something wrong. That pain is the wrong signal, right? Do you see that? So if we understand from a premise that our body is smart, then we're going to start respecting the signals that are coming from it. And we're going to ask different questions. We're not going to ask the question, how can I just make the pain go away? We're going to ask the question, if my body's smart and it's giving me a pain signal, what do I need to change? What do I need to do better at? What do I need to heal up? Our nervous system is the master system in the body, and our spine is the suit of armor that protects it. And can we all agree that modern life is unnaturally stressful, right? We definitely have a stressful environment that we're living in today, more stress than we've ever had before. So that's what's causing the, the stress patterns in our system. And we're going to look closely at this idea of stress. It's coming at us from all angles. So certainly we have the mental emotional stress. We also have the chemical stresses that we're exposed to. 
and we have the traumas, the physical stresses that we're exposed to. We have both the macro stresses, the car accidents, the sports injuries. We're just coming out of winter where there may be sledding injuries. We're going into uh, springtime, summer. People want to start getting active again, doing their sports, right? So macro traumas definitely can happen, but they can also set us up for creating misalignments that even when the pain goes away from that macro trauma, there may be patterns in the nervous system, in the spine that didn't heal up properly. Maybe you don't have pain from it then, but later it starts to lead into problems. So the macro trauma is definitely a problem, but it's not necessarily the most common cause of having problems with your low back. There are also other things. You don't have to have car accidents and sports injuries to harm your back, right? We just came out of snow shoveling season. We're getting into gardening season. That's coming up, so does that look familiar? But then we also have the slips and the falls that can happen. And then these things, again, are one of the factors, but the most common thing that is this most common physical stress that we have is the micro traumas. So the micro traumas are coming from our posture and our bad habits. So you check it out, like the devices that are being used in teens and adults, not to mention younger kids. We have backpacks in children and just poor postures as they work at desks. We have gardenings coming up. We have even travel, like trying to fit into these seats on planes, right? So all around us, there are occasions and our lifestyles being engineered to have physical stresses, poor posture, bad habits. It's the micro traumas that are the problem. And sitting is actually one of the biggest problems that we have. If we look at over time what has happened in our culture, we're sitting more than we ever have before. And we look at kids growing up, they're sitting in school. We look at, then you graduate from college, you're getting a job, you're spending maybe eight to 10 hours a day sitting. And if you're also sitting at a screen, this is the biggest problem that we have today in our culture. The biggest problem to our health that we have that is causing so many health problems is actually sitting at screens. They talk about sitting as the new smoking because we're sitting so much is affecting our health. If sitting is the new smoking, screens are the new crack, <laughs> right? That's how bad of a problem it is. And this is putting a stress on us physically, but it's also the sedentary nature. We're exercising less and less and less. We're sitting more and more and more. And so it's that combination of the, the impact of it on your physiology, the poor posture, combined with not moving your body. That combination is what's really being the, the, bi the biggest problem here and stress causes the subluxations or the nerve interference. So a subluxation is where the vertebrae misalign. And when they misalign, that vertebra misaligns, we see uh, the vertebrae misalign, and we see it putting pressure on the nerves. So it starts to interfere with the nerves. It's interfering with this whole joint. So when you have misalignments, the joint misalignment, that leads to damage of the soft tissue. That soft tissue then has inflammation that comes along with it. Just like if you sprain your ankle and it gets inflamed, if you sprain or misalign this joint, it can become inflamed. And that can start to irritate the nerve. When the nerve gets irritated, your smart body says, let's stop the movement in this area. And it's gonna take the muscles that usually would move the joint. And those muscles are gonna now change to stabilization. It's gonna strap down the joint. You're gonna get muscle spasms that will strap that joint down to try and stop the irritation to the nerve. That's your smart body spasming that muscle. So now when you have a spasm and that joint is not moving, the disc that is in between the bones, it, it has very little blood supply. The only way the disc gets fed nutrients and gets toxins removed is through movement. It's like squeezing a sponge. The only way you get fluid in and out of a sponge is through squeezing it. The only way that we can squeeze a disc to get the nutrients in and the toxins out is through movement. So if we strap that joint down, we no longer have movement and now the disc will actually start to break down. It'll deteriorate because of that loss of imbibition. Imbibition is that movement of fluid in and out of the, the disc. So when we have the lost imbibition, that leads to breaking down of function. The spasming of the muscle leads to fixation of that joint. And when the joint is fixated, the signaling going to the brain, now that signaling that the brain is expecting movement signaling, saying everything's good down here, we're moving, 
When you stop getting the movement signals, the brain says there's a problem and it goes into that stress response. And so we have a movement deficiency syndrome happening locally at the joint from the subluxation. And not to mention if we also are sedentary, that's another kind of movement deficiency syndrome where we're not moving enough, but when we have that spasming happening locally, that's also a problem. And that leads to a toxic global physiology when we have a local movement deficiency at even just one joint. And again, you can have this subluxation here and you may have no pain associated with it. And that's what actually makes it so tricky and dangerous is because people don't know that it's going on. And then they go to pick up their keys and all of a sudden their back goes out, meaning they are, they're feeling something now. Do you see? All right. And so if we're going to be addressing this, there's things we need to do, right? Some things we need to stop doing. So we also have to maybe just reduce and slow down on other things. And there are other things that we need to start doing. So that's what I want to spend the rest of the time on is what, what are these things we need to start doing so that we can address this problem. Our best results come with a three-legged stool approach. So when we talk about the three-legged stool, adjustments in a rhythm, the adjustments are what we do to correct the misalignment in the spine. Breaking the bad habits that keep recreating the patterns and then exercises to strengthen the spine so you can start living your life again in a stronger and stronger way. So we're gonna unpack each one of these. And what's interesting is the adjustments over time create such a healthy uh, scenario for the body that even at the genetic level, when they look at something called telomeres, which are at the ends of the genes, on the, on the genes and the chromosomes, the telomeres, as you age, those telomeres break off and are, um, and are not repaired, and that's called aging. What they found with regular chiropractic care is you actually could have a better ability to repair those telomeres, even something as amazing as that. So corrective care means adjustments in a rhythm, and that's because as we're adjusting your spine, it's a cumulative effect. The healthier that your joints in, get in your spine, they get healthier and healthier. The more unhealthy the joints are, they're getting sicker and sicker. So it's a cumulative thing. And so we want to have some momentum with that. And that allows your body to spend more and more time in the healing mode rather than in the dysfunctional mo mode. So adjustments in a rhythm are where we get our best results. But that it doesn't stop there. Because if you keep living your life the same way, doing the same bad habits, then it's gonna be much harder for us to get the results that we want. So we also need to teach you how to stop doing the wrong things. Now, when we look at the muscles of the spine, I think this is an important thing to understand as well. You have the small muscles in the spine, and these are kind of automatic muscles. They're not voluntary, the multifidus muscles, they're automatic. And little tiny movements in the spine are gonna send signaling from these little tiny fine muscles that will tell the brain exactly where your body is in, sp in space in a very precise way, very precise. But it takes a little bit of movement to send the signal to the brain and the brain will get that signal right from exactly that little muscle and that one and that one. And so it paints a very clear and accurate and precise picture in the brain of where the body is in space, okay? The bigger muscles on the outside, the erector spinae muscles, those are the ones that are doing the work. And so those are over the top. Now, when you have a subluxation or a spasm, when you have an injury, if these muscles are spasming, it stops these muscles from moving. And if these muscles are not moving, they're not sending the signaling. And so the brain starts to get a more vague idea. It's not getting that precise picture anymore. It's getting a vague idea of what's going on there. And that's where you're more vulnerable to injury because the brain isn't getting that accurate way of being able to course correct in a very precise way. So that's an important factor. And if we misalign the vertebrae, then there's gonna be altered stretch on these, these muscles as well. So the signal be, will become distorted as well. So back to our three-legged stool. So adjustments in the rhythm are important, but breaking the bad habits is also important. 
And so some of those bad habits are, you know, which exercises do I do and when? And actually, I want, to, I want to go to the exercises first. How do we strengthen the spine? So depending on what is going on, if you have a sacroiliac instability, I'm going to give you different exercises. If you have lumbar disc problems, I'm going to give you different exercises. If you don't have a disc or sacroiliac, but you still have subluxations, I'm going to give you different exercises. So I'm going to be precise about it with you as an individual, but I want to give you a general idea of what are the things that are helpful. So there's four aspects to this idea of exercises. First is we need to do a spinal assessment so we know what kind of problems you have. And I want to go into a little, I want to unpack that a little bit so you can see what I mean by that. Um, so we have objective criteria of how we're going to be measuring the presence of subluxations. The instrumentation that I mentioned earlier that measures the nerve supply to the muscles, the nerve supply to the organs, that we're, we're going to do those scans to help us identify asymmetries. Is one muscle pulling more on one side than the other? If you do have an asymmetry there, then you start to exercise when it's too soon and you don't have enough balance, you could be creating more and more of an asymmetry. So the scans actually give us good feedback of when it's time for you to start exercising, when it's safe to do that. So many people that have back injuries, they're afraid to start exercising again when actually exercise is what they need. If you think about it, if you get a cavity, you don't stop eating food right? You just have to learn the right way of what to do. So the right way to brush, the right way to floss, the right foods to eat. If you have a back injury, you don't want to stop moving. You want to learn the right way to move and the right time to move and how to move. So that's what we want to be teaching you. Our palpation is feeling the spine, feeling if the vertebrae are misaligned and how they're moving. If there's a loss of range of motion, that tells us an area where it's stuck and spasmed and likely where there's subluxation in that area. And then also we look at posture. So can I get you to a volunteer to come up so I can show you the postural piece? Okay, so I'm going to have you just turn and face this way. And so we know one of the things we'll assess in posture is looking at levelness. So are we pretty scare, square here? So when we look at, uh, at Jerry here, when we look at you, first I would like to look at what's happening in the levelness of the head. And so I like to see, is it level or is one ear higher than the other? If we look at the shoulders, is there one shoulder that's higher than the other? That can talk about distortion in the middle of the spine. And then we would also look at the hips and we'd look to see, are the hips level? If you turn to the side, we want to see that everything is lined up and stacking. So are the, is the center of the hips over the center of the ankles? Is the center of the shoulder over the center of the hips? Is the center of the head over the center of the shoulder? So sometimes I'll have people standing, and when they stand up, they're standing leaning forward or they will stand and they'll, they'll be standing like this and that will create a lot of stress right in the lumbar spine. So looking at posture tells us a lot about what's happening in the spine. It's the window, the posture is the window to the spine. All right, thank you very much for demonstrating for us for that. Now of course x-ray is another tool that we can use as well and um, all of these things together are what give us our most, uh, our best information. There are other very specific checks that I'll do that will help me to identify is this a sacroiliac instability, is this a lumbar disc instability, is it a subluxation, we'll, we'll look at all of those pieces. If there is sacroiliac instability, that is an, its own form of subluxation. If there are disc herniations, there's going to be subluxations involved with that as well. All right, and so that's the spinal assessment. The next part is once we have the assessment, then I know what kinds of exercises to recommend. So warming up and cooling down is certainly important to get the muscles ready to and the joints ready to be moving for exercise. Um, and then flexibility is really important. So before we go into strengthening the muscles, we want to make sure there's flexibility that the, that strength is being built on. And so one of the best things for the lumbar spine, lumbopelvic area, as far as flexibility, is squats, squatting. The rest of the world doesn't do all the sitting, they do squatting. When they're going to relax, they'll squat to relax. So we, in our culture, because of all the chairs that we have, we've lost the ability to squat. So you want to regain that ability. So first off, you want to be standing with your legs about shoulder width apart, the toes slightly apart. You can use your arms as a counterbalance. 
when you bend down, you're going to lower your tailbone down. You're going to even push it back a little bit as you go down. So you're going to be pushing the tailbone back as you go down and, what's, and the body is staying upright. And what's also happening is my knees are not going in front of my toes. And so you can go down into a pretty deep squat if you have that flexibility and then coming up. So that's from the front, from the side. Again, you want to have the tailbone going out a bit as you go down and then you can squat all the way down, get a nice stretch there, and then you can come back up. Okay, if you can't do that, maybe you have challenges with your knees or you just don't even have the strength to do that, then you can do your squats into a chair. So you can just slowly, slowly, slowly just let yourself down. And right here, you're gonna be working. You're gonna be working and working and working, and then you're sitting. And then when you come up, Right here, you're working really hard as you do it very slowly, and then you're coming up. So a lot of times when people have back trouble, even if they're without pain, they're gonna sit down like this. They sit down, they plop down rather than control that, so they're losing that flexibility. As you get the strength to be able to do your squats properly, then you can start to do them a little bit lower and a little bit lower and a little bit lower. Our, our spine is gonna be straight. We're gonna have strong lumbars here. We're gonna have a crease right at the hips um, and the, the hips will drop below parallel. The knees are gonna be tracking above the toes and not in front of the toes. The weight is gonna be on the heels. The feet are shoulder width apart and the torso is upright. So it's perfect and, and so we can recognize that toddlers, they better do this right or their head is so big, if they do it wrong, they're gonna fall over, <laughs> right? So they have to do it the right way. But it's beautiful to see that flexibility early on and it's awesome if we can keep that through our whole life. And if we've lost it, we wanna do everything we can to recover it. So flexibility is key. Then when we look at core strengthening, I've got my ball here. Okay, so core strengthening. There's a few ways that I teach this. So the standing posture is the inner corset. So Esther Gokale is a, a, somebody I've learned so much from about posture. And so she talks about the, the proper standing posture and, and creating the inner corset. So many people, as I said, they'll stand something like this. And with the proper way to stand, what you wanna do is you wanna start by raising your arms over your head. When you do that, you're going, it's going to lift up all of the, the tissue and the muscles. It's going to lift it up. So once you feel how it's lifted up, you're going to keep it lifted up even as you put your hands down. And then you're going to take the tip of your tailbone and you're going to lift it up and back. Notice that I'm not moving the top of my body. I'm only moving my tailbone up and back. And what I can feel happening is the weight is trans, transmitting from the, the balls of my feet to the heels, right in the front of my heels. So now I've got this beautiful curve at the very bottom of my spine, and now I'm just gonna tighten the ribs, just a millimeter, tighten it down towards my hips. Kind of the idea of taking my belly button and my belly button and pushing it, flattening it to my spine. All right, so now I have my inner corset, and I've got this strong corset. Uh, all the muscles all around are tight and strong. And so anytime I'm standing, I want to just keep coming back to my inner corset. And in our culture, it's not the posture we're used to. So the next thing you know, I'll forget about it and I'll be like this, like, oh yeah, back to my inner corset, back to my inner corset. So this is an active posture that you want to cultivate. So that's for any time you're standing, you can start working on your inner corset. Then the foundation training by Dr. Eric Goodman is another tool that I find is so useful. And again, he's teaching folks how to bend. And so he's teaching that you're going to have that tailbone lifting up and back as you're bending. And the key thing that I learned from him was that you should feel a stretch in the back of the hamstrings. So that's learning how to bend properly. You're bending forward and you're feeling the stretch in the back of the hamstrings. So many people when they bend, bend like this totally vulnerable. If you lift the tailbone up and back and feel the stretch in the hamstrings, now you've got that right. So anything you're doing that requires bending, you want to train yourself into that. And the foundation training exercises, they strengthen and lengthen the whole posterior chain from the base of the occiput all the way down to the ankles. 
Um, so he has a whole series of exercises that he does. I find the basic ones work really, really well. He also talks about just lengthening the torso as well. So even as you're bending, you're not doing this, you're lengthening this, you're lengthening the front as well as you're bending. Foundation training exercises. SI exercises, if you, sacral iliac is the, the concern, there's a series where you're gonna be lying on your back and you're gonna be stretching the piriformis and the muscles in the buttocks on either side. Um, and then I also like to add into that lunges because the lunges will stretch the psoas muscle, which is a big uh, a, a guide, it's like guide wires, stabilizers of the lumbar spine. So doing lunges as well on either side. And then also um, doing some other exercises that will strengthen and, and lengthen the posterior chain. And then the plank. The plank is one of the best core strengthening exercises. So when you're doing a plank, remember that you are going to be you're going to be on, if you can, you're going to be on your toes and on your hands and you want your body to be straight. So no sinking down and no butts up in the air. You want to have a straight body. What you want to work towards is trying to get yourself so you can do two minutes of a plank, two minutes long. And that's a really good um, thing to, to shoot for. If you have trouble with the wrists, you can, you can have your hands in, in a fist like that. Okay, so that's the basic plank. So that's the first level of doing those things for the first level of the core. Then the second level, to do, take it to an advanced level, is the plank on the move. So that's where you can be doing the plank where you might maybe are, and, and in the beginning with the plank also when you're in the beginning, you might have to be stay on your knees, but again you just want to still work with getting your whole torso straight. So you don't want it sinking down, you don't want the butt up in the air, you want to have a straight body. But when you can, you want to work to get towards the, the, to doing it on your toes. Uh, when you want to do a moving plank, then that's one where you're on your toes and then maybe you are lifting one hand up on one side or the other. And so you're moving with that. Another way to do it is using a, a physio ball. So you can clasp your hands, get a, a, your elbows right into it, and you can get on it. And now you're going to, woo, <laughs> you're going to do maybe figure eights with it. Or maybe you're going to draw your name with an alphabet so you can have fun with it. And this is much harder. So this will give you more of a workout. And again, working to, for the core. So the plank is a fantastic one to really protect your low back because you're building your core in a beautiful way. Uh, my least favorite way of building core is doing crunches, doing sit-ups. That's, uh, that, that's one that oftentimes causes problems for people. So I prefer people just use the squatting and the planks as core exercises. Uh, and the, the, the physio ball I just showed you. Um, and then you can get into, again, more sophisticated ways like using CrossFit or Pilates or yoga to develop more and more core. But these are the ways that you can start out with it. And again, this is the safest way to do it, to make sure you're doing the first ones first and then move into the second level. All right, so those are the exercises to strengthen. And then we're looking at breaking the bad habits. So what are the bad habits? They are going to be based on how you eat, how you move, and how you think. So if you look at bon a bonfire, it requires three things, fuel, air, and spark. You can't have a bonfire with just fuel or just air or just spark. You need all three. And so when, it's, when we're looking at bad habits, we have to address all three, how you eat, how you move, and how you think. And so when we look at these three, let me just pop forward, yeah, okay. When we look at these three, how you eat, you want to be looking at an anti-inflammatory diet. Because if you're not doing that, then if you've got low back problems that have inflammation associated with them, and you're eating inflammatory foods, you're just feeding the fire. You're going to make it much harder to heal up that tissue if you keep feeding the fire. So anti-inflammatory diet is the best, best way to go there. If we're looking at how you move, again, Movement is important, but safe movement is the way we want to do it. So think about um, how often you're moving and try not to sit for more than 30 minutes at a time. Getting up and moving, and you don't have to move a lot, but you have to move somewhat. 
And it turns out that people that are afraid of moving because they've hurt themselves before and then they just back off from all exercise, the best way to get started with movement is just not to sit. Find ways not to sit. That's the key thing. So how you're moving is important with that. And then when we think about how we think, so it turns out that stresses, stressful thoughts, also can be a factor for triggering low back pain. And it turns out that the most common incidence of herniated discs and low back pain for men is when they are having financial stress. And for both men and women, divorces are one of the most common factors that will trigger low back pain and herniated discs. So that's how you think. I like to recommend people use EFT, the emotional freedom technique, which I also teach, and that's just t tapping on the endpoints of the acupuncture meridians to turn the stress switch off. Prayer, meditation, walks out in nature, getting good sleep, those are all important factors in that same category of how you think. Um, if you're not doing those things, then you could be increasing stress and increasing inflammation in your body. So it's a three-legged stool that we use. And what I would like to do is to um, work with you a little bit on your squatting so we can look at that, work one-on-one -on -one with that to make sure you're doing that right. Come into the office so that we can, again, just check you on your form with some of these things. And we can also identify, if you're already a patient, right? we wanna just identify that you're doing everything properly. If you're not a patient yet and you're curious about this, then um, we have a special, if you're watching this on our website, from, through our website, then we have a website special. So you can call us and ask us about that. Um, but don't wait. And if you want to prevent low back problems from happening, then we want to do an assessment as soon as possible and then give you the coaching so that, and the guidance so that you can get that healthy spine that you really want. If you're already struggling, then come in right away so you can prevent further damage from happening. So I thank you for your time and attention. I hope this was helpful for you. And I look forward to seeing you next month when we're going to be covering allergies, asthma, breathing problems, that sort of thing. So thanks so much.